mata, assim você me mata. Ai, se eu te pego, ai, ai, se eu te pego, que delícia, delícia, assim você me mata. Ai, se eu te pego, ai, ai, se eu te pego, hein? Every day, nurses change lives. They overcome challenges set before them to reach each one of us, to advocate for health for all, and deliver the vital care we need when we need it, wherever we are. The work of nurses goes so much further than just health. They're champions for rights. They're upholders of fundamental principles about non-discrimination, equity, access to health care. About half the people around the world don't have access to fundamental health services. Nurses are absolutely critical to ensuring that people can access health care when they need it, at the right time, not just for themselves, but also for their families, for the communities that they live in. Nurses are creating new opportunities to provide care to the people most in need. Nurses are leading the way in many areas of care. It's important that nurses share that knowledge at every policy table and every strategy in relation to healthcare. Health for All is not an endpoint, but a call for action in the area of social justice, with the core principle that all countries and the international community should seek to improve people's health. We need nurses who are also in leadership positions. At every seat where decisions about health care are made, you must have a voice from nursing. What we need is investment in nursing. We need to build the capacity of nurses. We need to retain our nurses and we need to provide adequate resources for nurses to remain in the profession. Nurses are a powerhouse for change. Every day, individually, you are changing the lives of people all around the world. Nurses are a voice to lead. Nurses, a voice to lead, health for all. Les infirmières, une voix faite pour diriger, la santé pour tous. Enfermería, una voz para liderar, la salud para todos. Join us in raising the nursing voice to ensure we deliver health for all.
Every day, nurses change lives. They overcome challenges set before them to reach each one of us, to advocate for health for all, and deliver the vital care we need when we need it, wherever we are. The work of nurses goes so much further than just health. They're champions for rights. They're upholders of fundamental principles about non-discrimination, equity, access to health care. About half the people around the world don't have access to fundamental health services. Nurses are absolutely critical to ensuring that people can access health care when they need it, at the right time, not just for themselves, but also for their families, for the communities that they live in. Nurses are creating new opportunities to provide care to the people most in need. Nurses are leading the way in many areas of care. It's important that nurses share that knowledge at every policy table and every strategy in relation to healthcare. Health for All is not an endpoint, but a call for action in the area of social justice, with the core principle that all countries and the international community should seek to improve people's health. We need nurses who are also in leadership positions. At every seat where decisions about health care are made, you must have a voice from nursing. What we need is investment in nursing. We need to build the capacity of nurses. We need to retain our nurses and we need to provide adequate resources for nurses to remain in the profession. Nurses are a powerhouse for change. Every day, individually, you are changing the lives of people all around the world. Nurses are a voice to lead. Nurses, a voice to lead, health for all. Les infirmières, une voix faite pour diriger, la santé pour tous. Enfermería, una voz para liderar, la salud para todos. Join us in raising the nursing voice to ensure we deliver health for all. Every day, nurses change lives. They overcome challenges set before them to reach each one of us, to advocate for health for all and deliver the vital care we need when we need it, wherever we are. The work of nurses goes so much further than just health. They're champions for rights. They're upholders of fundamental principles about non-discrimination, equity, access to health care. About half the people around the world don't have access to fundamental health services. Nurses are absolutely critical to ensuring that people can access health care when they need it, at the right time, not just for themselves, but also for their families, for the communities that they live in. Nurses are creating new opportunities to provide care to the people most in need. Nurses are leading the way in many areas of care. It's important that nurses share that knowledge at every policy table and every strategy in relation to healthcare. Health for All is not an endpoint, but a call for action in the area of social justice, with the core principle that all countries and the international community should seek to improve people's health. We need nurses who are also in leadership positions. At every seat where decisions about health care are made, you must have a voice from nursing. What we need is investment 
in nursing. We need to build the capacity of nurses. We need to retain our nurses and we need to provide adequate resources for nurses to remain in the profession. Nurses are a powerhouse for change. Every day, individually, you are changing the lives of people all around the world. Nurses are a voice to lead. Nurses, a voice to lead, health for all. Les infirmières, une voix faite pour diriger, la santé pour tous. Enfermería, una voz para liderar, la salud para todos. Join us in raising the nursing voice to ensure we deliver health for all. Every day, nurses change lives. They overcome challenges set before them to reach each one of us, to advocate for health for all, and deliver the vital care we need when we need it, wherever we are. The work of nurses goes so much further than just health. They're champions for rights. They're upholders. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting the session in two minutes' time. Please take your seats. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. How are you this morning? How are all the superheroes in the hall? Did you recharge your superpowers overnight? No, some of you don't sound too sure. Believe me, you are much stronger than some of you might think. So we had a fabulous day yesterday. How good was it to start our day? 
to start our day with the WHO Chief Nursing Officer. I don't get tired of saying that. The WHO CNO, Elizabeth Aro. <clears throat> yeah, let's give it up for Elizabeth again. So I, I don't know about you, uh, but I, when I went to bed last night, I still had in my head going around all those areas of global health that Elizabeth told us she was working on to show how important nurses are to get the job on global health done. And do you know who the first person was I saw when I woke up this morning? Careful. I turned on my TV and Elizabeth was on the TV doing an interview on the local TV station. In my newspaper yesterday, Prof Lim from the Singapore Nurses Association was uh, a big photo of her in the local paper. Uh, colleagues, it's a really important reminder that this event is not just about the people who are in this room. It's about the 20 million plus nurses right the way around the world who are still joining us on YouTube. So you are still being streamed live to your colleagues around the world. I think we should say a good morning, bonjour, buenos dias to all the nurses of the world. Give them a big shout out to everybody who's watching us on YouTube. I have two pieces of housekeeping only for you this morning, please. Uh, are you enjoying the food? Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. All of the food is in that area over there. Please don't have your food in the exhibition because we need all the space for the exhibitors. Please go over there to have your teas, your coffees, and your lunches. Uh, the second housekeeping, I know that lots of you are taking pictures and videos. That's fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. Please, colleagues, just check with the people that you are taking pictures or videos of that they're OK with it, that you have their permission as well. So if I can just leave you with those two pieces of housekeeping, that would be great. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, it is now an honor and privilege on behalf of the International Council of Nurses and all of us to introduce to you Mr. Kim Wang Sik, the former Prime Minister of the Republic of Korea who held that great office between 2020 and 2013. He is highly respected by the people of Korea as an effective, humble, and sincere leader. During his time as prime minister, he was particularly concerned with the livelihood of the population, with an emphasis on care and protection of laws and principles. He is currently the co-chair of the committee to nominate Marianne and Margarita for the Nobel Peace Prize. We are honored that he has joined us here today, and I now welcome him to the podium to talk about these two incredible nurses who represent the leadership, commitment, and dedication of so many nurses around the world, and to explain how all of us can support their nomination. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Kim Wan Sik. Good morning. President of ICN, Annette Kennedy, and respected nurses joining us today 
from more than 130 countries, almost 140 countries. I am truly honored to have the opportunity to speak at ICN Congress today. Since retiring from my position as the Prime Minister of Republic of Korea, I have actively engaged in various social contribution activities. Among them, I have been leading the movement for recommending Marianne and Margarita, the two nurses from Austria, for the Nobel Peace Prize. In the early 1960s, these two nurses crossed the world to come to Korea where they had no connections and devoted over 40 years entirely to treating the sick and the frail. What they brought them was not expensive drugs or latest medical equipment. It was purely the spirit of love and desire to care for patients. Like Marianne and Margarita, it's you, nurses of the world, who carry compassion in your hearts and perform what can be done without love and altruism. Nurses do not work simply to earn a living. They perform noble work that requires self-sacrifice, dedication, and commitment. This is why nurses are known and called as the angels in white robes in Korea. But the reality is, it is difficult for nurses to fulfill their roles and mission commensurate with this title. Nurses are in too short supply and their work environments are poor. Despite always being their professions and being in the position to speak for them, nurses have neglected, have been neglected, and have not been able to exert sufficient influence in policy making. It is time for the governments and the society to take a special interest and provide support for nurses so that they perform their roles and mission in keeping with their love for patients and the spirit of self-sacrifice. What is good for nurses is good for humanity and society as a whole. In this context, as a citizen of the world, I fully support the Nursing Now campaign. Above all, I strongly promote the belief that it is necessary to strengthen the roles, recognition, and status of nurses for the purpose of achieving universal health coverage. I would like to take this opportunity to think about the efforts required to improve the status of nurses and strengthen their professional roles. First, being professionals at the forefront of healthcare, 
nurses must listen to and speak on behalf of the patients. They are the healthcare professionals working closest with patients. Nurses are on duty all around the world 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. They are the core of the healthcare field with the largest number in the global healthcare workforce. They are indispensable, most valuable experts in healthcare. From gaps between institutional procedures and actual suffering of the patients to blind spots in healthcare administration, as well as adopting new ways for a for more efficient rational healthcare system, it is the nurses who truly identify the difficulties and suffering of patients before anyone else. You, the nurses, are able to speak and ask questions on their behalf. And together with your high level of education and professional training, you are the ones who understand healthcare better than anyone else in society and therefore can voice a more vivid and persuasive opinion. Let's think of how to use this advantage to identify the problems in the field and communicate them more effectively as champions of health care. Second, communication and solidarity is vital for the enhancement of nurses' rights. There has been some good news for nurses recently. The World Health Organization, the World Health Organization designated 2020 as the International Year of the Nurse and Midwife at the General Assembly held last month. This is in recognition of and an encouragement to nurses everywhere who have devoted themselves to the enhancement of human health. It confirms the, the important roles of nurses in ensuring universal health. Not only that, it also urges governments to dispatch well-trained nurses to hospitals and communities and ensure that nurses enjoy a healthy work environment in order for nurses to fulfill their duties and mission, good working environment must be established. <laughs> nurses must, must be able to have an active say at the healthcare policy table and governments need to provide backing for this purpose with keen interest and policy support. It is necessary to establish a department dedicated to nursing policy and to appoint nurses as senior managers to oversee operations. Well-structured Independent laws need to be established as well in order for everything to work in coordination. Furthermore, we need leadership like that of Florence Nightingale, who
who persuaded policymakers to build a nursing system that allows for patients to be properly taken care of. This requires efforts by nurses to communicate with and persuade governments, healthcare organizations, and citizens. Instead of confrontation, nurses need to take a modest and humble approach and continuously persuade through dialogue. It is imperative to build solidarity among nurses everywhere to achieve this goal. I believe the ICN Congress has presented us an excellent opportunity in this time of significant change. I hope it serves as a venue to exchange information and share your splendid ideas as well as plans of action to communicate with civil society. Finally, I would like to emphasize the spirit of love and devotion. The world that I dreamed of during my 40 years of public service was a warm and healthy society in which everyone lived together in harmony. A society where the global community as a whole can enjoy peace and prosperity and everyone can enjoy freedom without discrimination. The foundation of such a society is philanthropy. And the spirit of love, freedom, and equality cannot be achieved without philanthropy. In order to bring about new change, I believe it is necessary to pay more attention to the roles, spirit, ethics, and the principles of nurses. We must care for patients and neighbors in need through love and dedication. Of course, it won't be easy. However, through these efforts, the identity and the status of nurses will be firmly established and nurses will obtain the respect and support of society. <clears throat> to finish, I would like to share the story of Marianne and Margarita. Having graduated from the University of Innsbruck Nursing School in Austria, young Marianne and Margarita came to Korea in the early 1960s. They left their home to care for Hans and disease patients for over 40 years on Sorokdo, a remote island of Korea, to return only in the year 2005. When people stayed away for fear of catching Hansen disease, Marianne and Margarita treated and looked after them, after them with their bare hands. The two nurses lived the humblest of lives and shoulders the true meaning of the benevolence and humility. They are a living example of what the roles and value of nurses are. 
now in Korea, many activities are underway to recommend these two nurses for the Nobel Peace Prize. This isn't just to praise the noble deeds of two individuals. It is for society as a whole. It is to celebrate the spirit of love and sacrifice and how priceless it is as a community asset. The value of nurses will spread far and wide and nurses will able to inspire rightful respect when the world remembers the noble dedication and love of these two nurses and keep their legacy alive. I'm also confident that it will contribute to creating a warmer and more abundant world filled with compassion and gratitude. The year 2020 marks the 200th anniversary of the birth of Florence Nightingale and is the international year of the nurse and midwife. I believe this is the golden opportunity to awaken the interest of society by turning a spotlight to the roles and the status of nurses. Yeah, it has been an honor meeting many of the world's finest nurses here in the small but powerful and beautiful nation of Singapore. Let me now show you a video of the two nurses, Marianne and Margarita, as I close my speech. I wish all of you good health and happiness. Thank you. Max but Hago, Max but Hunt Dame, sunk her undung hamigayo. Undung hamensa kum sunk her ankurayo. Ton go back yukshibinion. Put down is it there, Sorokdore Chajan, Austria Ganusa, Mariana Magaret. Tilkot Gatten, Hansen in Dre Sanchoa, Kitten up from her automatin to Sarah. 누군가는 그들을 파란 눈의 천사라고 불렀다. 여기는 희망이 많이 없었잖아. 그래서 구실청하기 위해서 생각했었어요. 그 환자들 희망 심어야 되고 또 그렇게 각자 그렇게 희망 안에 믿음 안에 사랑 안에 살아야 된다. 작은 사슴을 닮았다 하여 소록도라 불리는 아름다운 이 섬. 하지만 이 작은 섬은 세상 사람들은 짐작하기 어려운 깊은 상처를 간직하고 있다. 강제 수용된 한센인들은 성취하는 몸으로 중노동에 시달렸고 유전병이라 하여 단종 수술까지 자행되었다. 60년대 당시엔 전염의 공포가 매우 컸다. 그래서 한센인들은 그들이 낳은 자식들과 함께 살수 없었다. 가장 비극적인 장소는 이곳 수탄장이었다. 보육소에 아이들을 맡긴 후 이렇게 멀리 떨어져 눈으로만 혈육을 만나야 했다. 바람이라도 부는 날에는 병균이 올라갈까 두려워 아이들은 언제나 바람을 등지는 쪽에 세웠다. 마리안느는 기꺼이 한센인 자녀들의 엄마가 되어주었다. 밥을 해주고 옷을 갈아입히고 
잠들기까지 사랑을 나누어 주었다. 그때만 해도 그렇게 정말 우리가 인정을 못 받았어요. 인간 야 밖에 진찰 해도 장갑 끼고 간호사들도 의사들도 그런 식으로 진찰을 받고 그러는데 이 양반들은 그 상체가 있는 상체에도 왼손으로 그 코를 막그 상체에다 냄새를 맡아요. 간호는 환자 앞에 있어야 간호지 간호사들이 맨날 그 이렇게 차트 정리하고 뭐 이렇게 의사 처방 받고 이런 데 시간을 많이 하면 간호가 아니라고 손과 발이 부지런해야지 간호지 머리만 잘 회전시키면 간호가 아니라고 월급을 받지 않는 자원봉사자 신분으로 43년간을 소록도에서 살아온 마리안느와 마가렛 자신들은 특별히 한 것이 없다며 아무도 모르게 편지 한 장만을 남기고 그렇게 떠났다. 사랑하는 친구 우리들에게 이 편지 쓰는 것은 저에게 아주 어렵게 썼습니다. 우리는 부족한 외국인으로서 큰 사랑과 존경을 받아서 뒤따라 네, 감사드립니다. 감사하는 마음으로 말을 드려요. 소록도 좀 가고 싶으세요? 요즘 생각 많이 나세요? 일생 동 초기 사람인데 생각나요. 초기 사람들은 초기 식구. 환자들. 누가 제일 많이 보고 싶으세요? 나 보고 싶어. 최근의 일은 기억하지 못했지만 소록도에서의 일들은 또렷이 기억해냈다. 이제 지났어. 뭐가? 소록도 시대. 이제 지났어. 행복 있게 살았어요. 저기에서 아주 좋았어. 마리안느와 마가렛은 가장 외롭고 가장 고통스러운 이들과 함께하고 싶었다. 그들에게 사랑을 주고 사랑을 받는 것. 그것이 그들에게는 가장 큰 행복이었다. 마리아나마가리타엠보디ーズアクスピースアンサクリファイスユーカンショーヨーサポートフォーディスカンペインバイゴイングトゥーデブーズオフディクリエンナーシーズアソシエーションインディエクシビショントサインアップトゥーデペティ
colleagues, it is now my very great pleasure uh, to introduce back to the stage your president, Annette Kennedy. Good morning, everybody. Come on. Good morning, everybody. That's good. That's much better. Thank you, President Kim, for your speech. And thank you to the Korean Nurses Association for doing all the work and trying to get the Nobel Peace Prize for those two ladies and for the nurses all over the world. It is a great initiative. It's taken a lot of work. And I would like you all to support it. It never fails to make me emotional every time I see the video. It's about compassion, compassion and the caring that nurses do every day of the week. And I would just like to add another thing to that in case I forget it later, because we're going to talk both together about what ICN is doing. But I just want to mention two things. One is that there's two people here, and they have a booth outside, and their names are Bonnie and Mark Barnes. And they are parents of a son who died in hospital in his 20s. And they wondered what they would do because they were so impressed by the compassion and caring of nurses. And so they set up an award for nurses to receive who are doing extraordinary work, particularly in the love and compassion and caring. And they're now in 30 countries worldwide, and they're in 200 healthcare organizations. Anybody can decide to nominate a nurse that they think is worthy of the award. I think they may be in the audience, I'm not sure, but I would like you to support them because it's very hard to lose an only son in his 20s, but they were so grateful for the love and compassion of nurses. And this, together with what we have heard this morning about the Korean initiative for the Nobel Peace Prize, I think they tie very well together. <laughs> and just another thing, Howard might have been dreaming of things last night, but I was on another tangent. I don't know if you saw the picture of the G20. All suits except three. Theresa May, who is the outgoing prime minister in the UK and probably will be replaced by a man. Of course, the president or prime minister of Germany, Angela Merkel and Christine Lacour from the IMF. Three, I think there were roughly 36 men. So I couldn't but tweet to say, you know, 50% are women, and where are they? <laughs> then I realized, they're here. <laughs> All the best leaders are here. So now we're going to tell you a little bit about what's happening. I keep forgetting I have this thing on. And I'm not used, like Howard, of walking the stage. I tried to teach him how to do an Irish dance. It didn't work. So, this is our board, and I would like our board to stand up because we have board members from quite across the world. We have Erica from Chile. We have Helen from China. We have Fatima from Abu Dhabi. We have Brigetta from Slovenia. We have Soon Rae from Korea. We have Leanne from Taiwan. We have Tembeke from South Africa. 
We have Lala from Spain. We have Rosita from Switzerland. We have Pam from the US. Lisa from Canada. Karen from Norway. And Giannis from Cyprus. I think that's everybody. They do great work on your behalf. They do great work voluntarily. And as they know, I'm a hard taskmaster, so I don't allow them any free time. So we have certain things that we do. They're all on different committees. We've, of course, the board that meets twice a year. We have our executive that meets four times a year, but unfortunately, over the last two years, I think, over conference calls and everything else, they have met a lot more times than that on conference calls. I've called them many, many times to help. So there is a conference and Congress committee. There is a um, membership committee. There is um, an awards committee. There is, no, I have another one. Constitution. constitution, the very most important one of all, the Constitution Committee. Yes, that's them all. And so they have to work very hard. And of course, we have our strategic plan. And our strategic plan, we'll hear a little bit about later. But that means that we have to do what you ask us to do and put it in our plan and make sure it's implemented. And then you can call us to account to say, yes, we are going according to plan, or we're not doing what you want, that's for sure. I didn't tell you about the countries. They went too fast. You went too fast. He's trying to get me moving because we, haven't, we both talk a lot. If you see the map on the right-hand side, the red is where we are. The white is where we'd like to be. And there are an awful lot of countries out there who need our help and support so much, and you're talking about countries that are in conflict, countries that are at war, countries that have pandemics, like Ebola and things like that. And creating um, an organization is difficult for them, and what we're trying to do is to allow them some support from us, even if they can't become members, or have and don't fit in with the Constitution right now, because my greatest aim is that everybody, everywhere throughout the world, would be able to be supported by ICN. Now we can move. <laughs> this is our strategic plan. It's simple, you've all got a copy, I hope. But basically, the aim and the mission has not changed over the 120 years. The aim is to provide the best care for patients throughout the world by the most common, competent educated nurses that we have. And to secondly, to make sure that nurses are in the best position to do so. And by the best position, I mean that they are getting the resources they need, that they're well equipped, that they're safe, and that they're remunerated properly so that we can retain our nurses within the profession. We have our three pillars, which will always remain the same. And the three pillars are, as you know, professional practice, regulation, and socioeconomic. And each, each of those three tie in very well together because we need the three. So we have four goals. Global impact, which you will hear about a little bit as we go on. We need to have an impact at global level so that that will filter down to regional level, and that you can call on your governments, whatever they agree at global level, that they will implement at national level, and that they make, you make sure they do so. Leadership, we'll talk a little bit about leadership and empowering you to be good leaders, to be involved in policy and strategic direction in your countries, at local level, at regional level, and at international level. And of course, one of the biggest aims is to empower our associations, to support our associations. 
And yesterday we had some great um, conversations with some of our NNAs about the issues that they have. And one of the ones that struck us most forcibly is the recruitment across the world by high-income countries from low-income countries for all sorts of reasons. And we know there's a shortage worldwide. But two of the biggest resource countries are now the shortage of their own nurses. And it is shocking, and I am going to name them, the Philippines and India. We are recruiting all over the world, and there is a perception out there that those countries have nurses that they can supply to other countries. That is not true. They're actually sending out more nurses per year than they have in their own country. The issues are complex, but that doesn't mean that th this should happen. And it's not about not allowing nurses to leave. Of course, they have to leave and make money and look after their families. But somehow or another, we have to make sure that they get enough money and resources and everything at home so that they can stay at home. Nobody wants to leave their families behind and go to another country. We'll go on or we'll be here all day. <laughs> uh, so you can see on this screen, these are the ICN strategic priorities. Universal health care coverage. Only about half the people of the world have access to fundamental health care services. Non-communicable diseases, primary health care, people person-centered care, safety. We've got significant sessions on safety uh, tomorrow. Antimicrobial resistance, mental health immunization, and the sustainable development goals. The sustainable development goals replaced the millennium development goals, and all countries of the world are signed up and committed to delivering on those. And of course, in order to do this work, we need to have enough nurses, we need to have a health care workforce. When you look at our priorities, colleagues, you will see that they are the same as WHO's global health priorities. The other thing that I think you will be struck by is that when you look at these priorities, this is the work of nursing. This is what we do. To improve the health of the world, you need nursing to deliver. You need to see nursing as an enabler. You need to invest. But if you invest in us, not only will you improve global health, as you heard yesterday from Jeremy, you will improve the prosperity, economic growth uh, of countries' economies. And as Madam President has, always, has also been very clear on, you start to address issues of gender inequality. How do we at ICN go about making that impact, trying to convince people of those arguments? One way is through our International Nurses Day resources that we publish every year. And for the last three years, we have focused on the Sustainable Development Goals, on health as a human right, and on health for all. Of course, we talk about the policy issues in those publications, but at their centerpiece are case studies of nursing practice from right around the world, which show the impact, the innovation, make visible what needs to be done, the people who are doing this on the ground to deliver improvements and, and health. Your case studies are gold when we advocate and campaign at a global level. They show clearly the people who will lead implementation, and they also help to make the case as to why we need nursing leadership. Nursing is a global, th is it, nursing is a golden thread from practice through to the policy table and why it must be represented in leadership positions. Our relationship with WHO, we have a special status and we've had it uh, since 1899, but it is not for life. 
we have to renew it every four years. And on this slide, you can see those areas of work that we have committed to work with WHO on over the course of the next four years. Universal health care coverage, promoting healthier populations and addressing health emergencies. And um, one of the fantastic things about having Elizabeth in post is that we developed this plan with, uh, with Elizabeth. Madam President and I met with Elizabeth and went to different departments in WHO to have discussions about how we put nursing in their work plans. As fabulous as your president is, she cannot represent us on everything, and that's where we come to you and rely on you. By being part of the ICN family, we can take you as experts and put you right at the heart, at the center of WHO decision making. I think this is mine. <laughs> you can see who's here. Dr. Tedros, Director General, and our Chief Nurse. And of course, we said before that we advocated very heavily for a chief nurse in WHO. But now we have to advocate very strongly for support for that chief nurse in WHO. I have to say that Dr. Tedros has been a great advocate of nursing. Somebody emailed me something about the, your president in Singapore saying she gets it. I would say equally the same about Dr. Tedros. He gets it. He gets the value of nursing. He gets the, what nursing can do for the population of the world. He has seen what it has done in Ethiopia. And every time we meet him, I am convinced of all the director generals that have ever been in WHO, he knows that without nurses, there will not be universal health care. There will never be an implementation of the SDGs, and we will not curtail the epidemics, and particularly the epidemic of the NCDs, the non-communicable diseases. So we've had several meetings with Dr. Tedros, and he has always been open to our recommendations, suggestions, our advice, and whatever else that we wish to tell. And I, I am so proud that we have such a good relationship with Dr. Tedros. So you can see here a picture of one of the meetings, our last meeting with Dr. Tedros. I feel a little bit sorry for him because when Madam President starts speaking and when I start speaking, his ears started to go a little bit red, I think, with everything that he was, he was hearing. Um, this picture, you can see uh, Jim Campbell, who heads workforce in this, in this picture, with Carrie McCarthy, who's leading State of the World's Nursing. You can't see, but two other important people who were there, of course, Elizabeth, but also the Director General's deputy, Susanna Jacob, as well. So we have a real sense that when we're meeting to talk about, we were discussing the plans for the year of the nurse here, but whether it's safety, primary, healthcare, state of the world's nursing, we've not just got the DG, we've got his key colleagues who will help to get shift, things shifted and work, work done. But when we say we are the global voice of nurses, it isn't just the president, the board, the ICN staff, it's you. We took a delegation of nearly 80 people to the World Health Assembly this year. The other picture that you can see is our nursing delegation to WHO. Yes, we're the global voice, but look at the global faces who represented you, who represented us. They did a fabulous job. I thank all of them. This picture was taken at 7 o'clock in the morning in the ICN offices. They worked very, very hard as well. Okay, as you can see, this reminds me of what I saw at the um, G20. This is the WHO Independent High-Level Commission on Non-Communicable Diseases. And I know they have put an arrow towards me in the red. So you can see the great crowd of commissioners around the table. A lot of them at the level of prime minister, presidents, high-level um, representatives of various um, companies from all around the world. 
and trying to influence that group takes a lot of um, time and energy. It's not that they don't want to do the right thing. Of course they want to do the right thing. But they have different experience to what our experiences as nurses. And their experiences in relation to treatment, our experiences in relation to health promotion, disease prevention, and getting there early to prevent communicable disease rather than anything else. And you see the first of part, this, it's in two parts, first part was launched already about the um, recommendations. The second part is about the implementation, and we have got nurses in there. And that took a lot of lobbying between us, Nursing Now, ICM, and a lot of other organizations. And we were very grateful to have that combined effort to lobby. It's my one. <laughs> 2020 is the year of the nurse. You know that. You've heard it so many times. We have, and you've also heard, it's the bicentenary of Florence Nightingale. You also know that it's the report on the state of the world's nursing. Three things happening together. It is our year. We have to make it our year. And now I'm going to ask you to stand up and make a commitment to make it our year. So I'd like you to stand up for a moment. You have to commit. I cannot do it for you. Your CEO can't do it for you. The board cannot do it for you. The responsibility is yours. If you don't make the most of the year, of the time that we have now, to put nursing where it should be, and to get the best conditions and the best resources for nursing, then you are, have not done anything. Please sit down, because this is only a smattering of what ICN is doing. I want the commitment from you. So colleagues, uh, another hugely important area uh, that we advocate on, we comment on, we make sure that nursing has a global voice on it is in relation to issues of social justice. This picture is of an ambulance strewn with bullets that was taken from Syria and was placed outside of the United Nations on World Humanitarian Day. ICN is a partner of a coalition called Safeguarding Healthcare Coalition. And a report was produced just a few weeks ago that showed that last year, 167 healthcare professionals were killed in war and in conflict zones. Over 700 were injured whilst working uh, in health facilities in war and in conflict zones. In complete contravention of all UN treaties and, obli and obligations. It's outrageous, and ICM will comment on it. We will call it out, and we will do that not just because if we don't, it, in, it normalizes these atrocities. We will call it out as well because it infringes the fundamental principles that our practice is based on. Is this mine? <laughs> Sorry, we, we didn't practice <laughs> before we got here. Anyway, this is our global nursing leadership. And as one of our goals is leadership. And if we don't get from our youth up to our experienced people in leadership positions, we're at nothing. We have to be at every table, but not just at the table. I mean, at the table is of no value unless you're representing at the table. And you have to learn about that because it's about influencing other people around the table. And that takes um, experience and initiative, and it takes um, kind of, what would you say? You're not good with words. Courage as well. Oh, yes, courage. I was looking for another word, but I didn't get it. Uh, we have quite a number of people that have gone through the leadership for policy courses. And we have a number of them here that have come together 
as a global alumni, and they have helped us, and we need them to help us. We need all our leaders to come back and help us. We also have Leadership for Change, and we're in around 60 countries worldwide. Currently, we have a big project going on, as you heard, with Johnson & Johnson in China. And we have a Lesotho project, the Girl Child Fund, which we are launching. Um, it's not a launch, but we're, we're looking for funding. We're looking for you to dig deep into your pockets because it's such a great initiative. But it's at lunchtime tomorrow that here, here, that we're talking about it. Okay. Um, we have disaster nursing competency. We have a lot of different guidelines. Just to say, this is only a, a kind of a quick version of what we're doing. If we were to tell you everything we're doing, we would be here till tomorrow. And the key staff who are leading on all this work are with us here uh, this week as well. So if you're interested in particular areas of work, let me know and we'll connect you with the staff leads. These are some dates for your diary for next year, major events that we know are already um, planned and will be happening. Uh, just the two that I want to particularly pull out to you, the World Health Assembly will be 17th to the 21st of May next year. But immediately before it, from the 12th to the 15th, we will be having the triad meetings. These are the meetings where we bring you as associations, chief nursing and midwifery officers, regulators and educators together for nursing meetings that happen immediately before the WHA. We know that we have got WHO support to make sure that there is a massive nursing presence at the meetings before the World Health Assembly and at the World Health Assembly as well. Colleagues, um, you have stood up and you have committed <laughs> to make every day count next year. You have made that commitment. I unfortunately only speak English, I'm not multilingual, but I went to a language which is a mother language for many of us, for Latin, for this phrase. Carpe diem nurses, carpe diem infirmeres, carpe diem infirmeras. Seize the moment, seize the opportunity, seize the day. This is our time, it is our responsibility, it is a shared responsibility. Together we must seize it. This is the future, our students. We have interns, we had a great student assembly, and we had them talk to the CNR. We have a plan of a strategy for the future for involving the students more in ICN, and we would like to see them more involved in your organizations. If we don't involve them now, what can we expect? Are our students here? Are there students here in the audience? Please stand up. Please stand up and show us. They're absolutely wonderful. I've met so many of them in the last two years, and I know that they are ready to take my chain any day. <laughs> they are ambitious, they're educated, they are smart, they have ideas. They don't have what we have on our shoulders is, you know, baggage. And they're enthusiastic. But one thing I would like to say to you that came forward from them themselves is the transition from student to nurse, the qualified nurse, is difficult for them. You need to help them. The educators need to help them. You need to support them. You need to mentor them. Because sometimes you wonder why they leave. They leave because they don't feel supported and nobody is helping them. So please make that an issue. I call on you to do that. We're out of time, are we? Our time is done, Madam President. She really does make me dance. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. We're just going to take 30 seconds to move to the next session. Uh, and let me introduce board member Karen Bureau, who's going to facilitate this session for us. Good morning, colleagues, and welcome to Maine session three. My name is Karen Bureau. I'm a board member of the International Council of Nurses. And in my daily life, I am a vice president of the Norwegian Nurses Organization. It's my honor and privilege to be moderating this session. Leadership in nursing is a major focus of this conference. And so in the first half of uh, this session, we will be addressing nursing leadership and policy, leading through noise to impact insights, to impact insights across generations. Our speakers in this session are Marla Salmon and Sarah Walji, and they will be, pre be presenting as a team. Dr. Marla Salmon is Professor of Nursing and Global Health and Adjunct Professor of Public Policy and Governance at George Washington University, at the University of Washington in the USA. She has a long and distinguished career as a nursing leader. Our second speaker, Sarah Walji, is a registered nurse from Canada and she is working in an acute mental health setting in Ontario. She is currently completing her master's degree in global health. And she is also young nurse representative on the Global Nursing Now campaign. Sarah is in the beginning of her career in, as a leader in nursing. Now, Marla and Sarah have planned an interactive dialogue for us here this morning. And as you can see, we've set up microphones uh, for you to participate. So get ready to participate and take it away, ladies. Good morning to everyone. We are very excited to be here. And uh, before we get started, you can see from our, our first slide that we have a baby boomer on one end and we have a millennial on the other and there are generations in between. And we are very committed to make this session the beginning of a conversation. Uh, so before we get into that, let me just ask, just show of hands, how many of you here has had a substantial conversation, a leadership conversation, with someone who is not in your generation. OK. There are some hands, and I hope that by the time this Congress is over, you will have had many more of those kinds of conversations, because they are, in fact, what will make sustainable leadership and impact on policy. So our session purposes, and I promise you this is the last PowerPoint slide that I will show that has bullets on it, are fourfold. And the first is to surface some of the characteristics that Sarah and I have together observed and developed. So I'll be sharing those with you, and they represent the thinking that we've developed over this last several months in our conversations and planning. The characteristics that we want to talk about are characteristics that go beyond the noise. And while the concept of voice is a powerful concept, often it is noise instead of voice. And so we're looking at taking that through into impact. Sarah will be providing a commentary following this presentation from her perspectives as an early career leader, talking about that in terms of the future. And we will also be using this cross-generational format in terms of the slides that you will be seeing. Uh, so basically, this is stage setting for your conversation. We'll start it here. We hope you'll continue it. 
I want to stop and pause on the millennial piece uh, because I've been challenged to look at the way that I'm presenting today and look at it through the lens of millennials. And for those of you who are millennials, I think you need to take credit for transformation in how we think about conveying ideas. I've been using a lot of words. Millennials use images. And images are far more powerful in communication than words. So we'll be using an image format. And think about it. Millennials are the ones that turned a telephone into a camera. They're the ones who brought you the emojis, the memes. And they are also the ones who have really surfaced the causes around the ecological challenges we face. And my favorite, which you'll see in these slides, is they are committed to preserving wildlife in its, in its natural state. So you're probably wondering where this is going. And I'll go first to our first slide, and I think you'll be able to see. So this is the format we'll be using. It's metaphorical. It represents through image some of these attributes. And this first one is fundamentally leadership that is going to make an impact in the long run that's sustainable is made possible by leaders who have purpose, who are driven by purpose, and I would add compassion, and who are not only purposeful but who are strategic and think through how do I get that purpose actually moved into real change that, that lasts and makes a difference? These leaders also know how to collaborate and how to partner. And we've heard earlier about reaching across barriers and disciplines in order to connect in ways that people can make a difference together. In this case, this is symbiotic, it's reciprocal, and here's this rhinoceros who is plagued by insects whose suffering is being relieved by a bird, and the, and the hunger of that bird is being relieved by the insects. So it is a symbiotic relationship. And that's the kind of collaboration that actually does make things move from noise into impact. The key, ultimately, to sustainable change is multi-generational and cross-generational communities. And looking out, I see a community of many generations and also many nations. And when you think about, metaphorically, the community of elephants, it's a community that supports its most vulnerable. It's a community that calls on its most strong. And it works together in a way that it preserves both the community and the individuals within it. So those are lessons that we get from leaders who really are about community and connection and intergen intergenerational collaboration. Now note that I'm not saying nurturing when I talk about how we work with generations that are on the early end of their careers. I'm talking about collaboration and partnership because all have contributions to make. So it's, it's great to talk about purpose, it's great to talk about strategy, and it's great to talk about collaboration. All of those things can happen and still have nothing happen as far as policy goes. The attractive part is on the end, and when you think about this bird, what that bird is going for is a viable chick at the end of the hatch. That's not going to happen unless those tough things that are the homework for that bird take place. That nest needs to be built. Those details of gathering what needs to be put together needs to happen. So metaphorically, you need to build that nest for the work to take place in order for the outcomes to happen in policy. This is the interconnection part. I think sometimes that we in nursing believe that our agendas are just for us. They're just for our patients. They're just for us. But actually, there are many agendas that we share. And I think those SDGs, these, the Sustainable Development Goals, are agendas that we can share with others, as well as the many others that ICN has identified. But that means embedding ourselves and immersing ourselves in the agendas of others and finding where our connection points are. I had a, a wonderful conversation with a colleague of mine, a very influential colleague in the policy arena, who told me yesterday that she is going to be meeting 
with uh, a group that absolutely disagrees with her position on one item. But their agendas actually converge at a higher level. So this is the kind of reaching across difference that is fundamental to having policy that actually makes a difference. All of that reaching across, reaching out, has with it, carries with it risk. And so I would go back to that first slide and thinking about that little cheetah who's standing on that limb, looking out, figuring out first what it wants and figuring out how it gets there. But the other calculation in that is what's the cost of doing it? Leadership is risky, it has a price, and the price is generally challenging. If policy were easy to make, it means that it's policy probably not worth making. So finding that altitude, figuring out how to hold on, but still be out on a limb, like this fellow is doing, and not being swept away is one of the challenges that has to be uh, surmounted by nurse leaders who are effective. It also means sometimes hanging out with people, or in this case, uh, hounds, that might well wish that you weren't there at all. And so if you can see the fox that's embedded with the hounds, those are the kinds of relationships that we need to start cultivating, is finding ourselves in our way out of our comfort zone, but getting to know what people think and what they are interested in achieving or interested in not achieving. So this is a lot to ask of any one person or any group of people, to be that purposeful, to be strategic, to be able to engage with others in a collaborative way, to practice reciprocity, and to, in some ways, reach well beyond our comfort zones. What it really means, though, is that together we have to ensure that each of us can pause, can cultivate our own resilience, can figure out when we need that altitude, when we need to retract, when we need to recalibrate. And this little guy has made it partway across the river, clearly seeing to the other side of the river, not there yet, obviously had a hard time, but has taken the time to get up on those stones and to stop for a minute, to rethink, to recalibrate, to reconnect. It's not easy to do. When you're part of a leadership situation, you are also often under a lot of pressure to perform over and over again. In order to make sure that you can carve out that space, to have that resilience, it means that you need to be able to ask others and depend on others to take their share and to take their time. This not only has benefit for you as a leader, but it also has benefit for whatever you're trying to achieve. One person alone cannot make it happen. And one, when one person is the symbol, one person is also the target. So it's critical that we share that. And it's also critical that you understand that you aren't the best person to represent everything. And that when those moments come, when you have someone else who can do it better, who has more of what needs to take place, put those people up, launch those people, have them stand on your shoulders. Let those who are most able carry the water. And obviously, the zebras are not going to be able to carry the water but they certainly do appreciate having the cooling effect of someone else carrying it. And then sometimes it's very hard to do this. It's very hard to celebrate the achievements of the group. I see a lot of celebration here of the achievements of the group, but it's so important that when those goodies come, that those goodies are shared. And it's also important to know that when you share them, people will come back again. I'm not sure that this uh, little prairie dog has quite mastered that, actually, yet. <laughs> so this final slide is to say that one of the great joys of leadership, that is leadership that really brings out these characteristics and lives them out, is learning. 
And when you learn, you grow. And when people learn together, they grow together. And so this process of bringing this part of today's, uh, today's session has been one of learning for me. I have really appreciated having time with Sara. And so we're going to turn it over to Sara to take it into the future. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for that, Marla. It was fantastic to set the tone and the scene for the presentation today and the conversation that's going to subsequently happen. And I look forward to engaging with everybody in the room and beyond to continue this going forward. Marla highlighted some key themes, and I'd just like to reiterate them and further emphasize upon them from a young nurse perspective or from a millennial and Gen Z perspective. And that's really the goal of today, is to spark that conversation and carry it forward within the cafes, within the subsequent dialogue, within the country levels, within the groups here that go beyond the room. Marla was really strategic in mentioning partnerships, collaborations, and the initiatives where we want to build up each other and be with one another. We want to further emphasize that Young leaders have the potential and the ability to be at the forefront and they need the support and collaboration from senior leaders and all those in the room to help build us into that role. It's capitalizing upon opportunities such as these where we want to invest and advocate for training, knowledge increase, and global experiences that allow us to engage in this type of dialogue. And this is really the momentum and the drive for passionate individuals such as yourselves in the room today. And I'd like, to all, I'd like to give you all a shout out at this point and a round of applause for all the efforts that have already been started and the efforts that will go forth following this conversation. So put your hands together and give you guys a round of applause. It's fantastic to see that we've got a number of support initiatives for our nurses across the globe, and we've got my young leaders in the audience today. And what I recommend you do is you do engage and interact with them as the day continues and as the Congress continues, and that you do work with them. They do have ideas that they want to bring forth, and a lot of them do want to be part, a part of that initiative building actively. If you open a door for a number of them, they do have these young minds, these bright ideas, and these passionate thoughts that want to carry forward and manifest into action. But oftentimes, unfortunately, it's that lack of shared, shared building and shared growth that kind of sways them and turns them away till a later point in their career. And that's something that I think the Nursing Now momentum and drive with young leader investment has really capitalized upon, and ICN's growth with young leaders is something we want to highlight within this Congress. And this conversation will only go forth, and it will allow for reflection, continued growth, and subsequent strategic action that we will take forward. And with that, we will start off our cafe. Okay, love to have someone put your hand up, stand up, say something about something that happened here or something you're thinking about having happened that can start to seed some ideas about what we could do while we're still here and in the future. Anybody stepping up? We have people who have microphones. This is your chance. This is where you hang out on, the, on that. Uh, okay, we got someone over here. <laughs> Got a couple of hands. Yeah, great. Good morning. I really enjoyed the session. Thank you for your sharing. I'm Mary Chen from Singapore Institute of Technology. We're running our honors degree nursing program with University of Glasgow. And my personally very concerned of uh, working with young nurses. And uh, it's just a, a comment uh, and my uh, thought after listening to your presentation. I feel that very encouraged. I would like to see that, you know, the story gave us a very beautiful sight of the community spirit. 
that even people with different opinions, they can finally come together because when they realize they are having a common purpose and a higher level. So I would like to encourage all of us here because I myself is doing a research using instrographic approach, look at the community of nurses, how they practice together, how the old members and newcomers and as our newly graduate nurses working together and gaining strength in the community of practice. So I will encourage that to reach that higher level of imagination. I would like to use E.T. Winger's community of practice concept, imagination. That means we need to engage together. We need to have mutual engagement. We, have to ha we need to have common purpose. We need to build that kind of common language, common knowledge to move together. Thank you. Thank you, that was fantastic. And it really highlights the key themes of today's session. And we want that thought process to manifest into some type of strategic plan and subsequent action, which we open up to you to take. And we welcome the next at the mic. Thank you. You know, one of the things is, and we've talked about this a lot, is that when you approach collaboration from different perspectives, that you're very likely not going to reach consensus, and that is probably OK. But trying to build common ground, those pieces that you can hold, like these characteristics that we talked about, you can, you can hold and share. And then those differences are really important in terms of enrichment. Hi, my name is Griselle, and I'm a nurse educator in the United States. A uh, question. When you talk about millennials and the younger generation of nurses, um, two questions. One, do you find, let's say transculturally, across the globe, are they the same characteristics that we're talking about? And second, if each of you could give one word of wisdom to nurse educators about how to encourage the next generation of nurses, what would that be? So clearly there are cultural differences and there are specific situational differences, but one of the things that is becoming more and more apparent across the younger generations is that social media has created cultures that transcend culture. And so that's, that's going to be very interesting to watch. Um, I'll turn to Sara in terms of recommendations. Yeah, um, one piece of recommendation that I would highly endorse would be active, meaningful engagement. You have students who want to give feedback. They want to be part of curriculum design, program implementation, evaluation, but they're not necessarily given that opportunity to actively be a part of that process. So I do recommend that that's something that we take forward as educators, as program implementers, as, as curriculum designers, and we each take away from that and hopefully apply it within the national settings and the local settings that we're going back to. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Martins Enemo. I am a nurse from Nigeria. We are about seven delegates from Shell, Shell Nigeria to this con Congress. And we preach, we give human performance and care that's one of our, our, our push. And when we came here, we saw that uh, the team is beyond healthcare to health. It really tallied with what we're doing. But essentially, I just want to ask a question and I want to just get more uh, in, insight into the last presentation we have, uh, you know, shifting from word presentation to, uh, you know, uh, pictorial presentation. And you talked a lot about animals, using animals as symbols of what we want to do. Yeah, have, we, have, you, have you considered, and I want us all here in this hall to consider uh, the fact that uh, um, we have what we call the food chain in the animal kingdom. Yeah, have we considered the state of uh, maybe a lion or a cheetah going out for uh, the squirrels and other small animals? Yeah, what, what in, in the practice, what can we say about uh, you know, the upcoming one? We just talked about students, you know, taking care of students. Yeah, uh, what, what, what have you considered what the relationship between the upcoming nurses and already made nurses 
uh, they're not going to be some way of uh, uh, carnivalism. Thank you. <laughs> those, are, those are fantastic points. Um, my own view is that in the, in the kingdom of animals, the elephants are absolutely the ones who have all of the right answers. So I'm, I'm going with the elephants on that, and I think the food chain occasionally gets disrupted by the elephants. But if you think about it, the humans are probably the most destructive of all of, the, of, all of our animals. So I'm going to turn it over to you, and we, we have like two more, I'm understanding, but I, I do want to remind people that um, we've got the policy cafes coming up, and those are good places to continue the conversation. So yes, let's go talk more about the animal kingdom and uh, the symbolism, of, but I'm turning it over to Sara for the next one. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, my name's Serena. I'm a, from Australia. I'm a part of the Emerging Nurse Leader that I presented at the Student Assembly um, on Wednesday. And I just have um, a question, really. The Nursing Now, I'm over here, Nursing Now Nightingale Challenge is um, challenging employers to develop leadership programs for people under the age of 35. And my question, really, to you guys and to the audience is how, if we put an age limit to that early career leadership, how are we supporting mid-career switches in early career development? And that is a great point. That's been a constant discussion that's been going on even beyond nursing now starting out. When a global initiative for students and novice nurses came out, it was, it was kind of looking at, okay, what is the definition of young nurse? What is the definition of youth? What do we want to see as students, novice nurses? Who can we encompass? And to be simple about it, unfortunately, you can't blanket a term that applies to everyone. You can't encompass everyone within that group. If you, if you were coining it as something early career, then okay, early career, are we looking at younger nurses? Are we looking at mid-career level nurses? Where's the age range with that? And I think there's been a lot of dynamic discussions with that. But I do agree that there is a need for support as early career professionals in general. And that need for building conversation and empowering nurses who do make shifts later in their career. Because they do combat a lot of the same issues as young nurses and as youth that are going into nursing. So that would be a, a definitive conversation that we could have for eons and eons and eons, and we can talk about it at quite some length, but I do encourage you to seek a couple of us out. I do know my Nursing Now team is actually present within the audience, so I do recommend you do go engage with them during the cafe sessions, reach out to a couple of leaders within the NNA that you are currently here with and speak to them about perspectives that you bring to the table and experiences that you want to bring forth and see invested into some kind of strategic action and plan going forward. But thank you, Serena. I appreciate it. Good morning. So I'm so sorry to have to do this because on the one hand, we said start the conversation and now you're starting it. So, um, but we also need to transition the conversation, not stop the conversation, transition it. Um, I would really encourage you, let me just ask you to put the Nursing Now hands up so you know who to talk to, who are in the audience. You said that you have folks in the audience. And if not, we'll, we'll find it for you. Um, and please talk to someone who isn't of your generation and ask what they're doing, whether it's an older person in terms of their time in their job or a younger person. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, the one thing that I want to say that I think is fundamental to this is that we all benefit from mentorship. And it's, it is a gift to be able to give it, and it's a gift to be able to ask for it. And that works at all stages in our career, and I think that openness to providing that mentorship, mentorship while also seeking it, and I still seek it, is a tremendous gift. And uh, Sada, thank you for your insights. It's been extremely helpful to me. And um, I think I'm supposed to close, but last words? Yeah, it's been a great opportunity to learn from you, learn with you, and grow with you. And I hope that this is only the start of everyone's conversations in the room. 
and this is the only start of ours. I know this is gonna be a great opportunity for us to learn and grow together and I go forth. <laughs> Thank you all for Thank your you participation so in the session. Very, we really appreciate much. it. to Marla Salmon and Sarah Wolji for this very invigorating discussion on nursing leadership. Thank you so much. Moving to the second half of this session, we will now turn to the topic of great import, uh, another topic of great importance to nursing, nursing innovation in primary health care. Now we've heard at this conference how Singapore is moving beyond health care to health with a greater focus on health promotion and, uh, and prevention. And beyond hospitals to communities, moving care into the primary health care setting in the community is of extreme importance and it's a very important arena for nursing. We're going to have a great impact on the community health care, primary health care setting in the next 10 years. That's an important note to note from this conference. Innovation is also a hot word today across the world, but we nurses all know that one of the greatest innovators in health care across time was Florence Nightingale. And next year, we will have numerous opportunities to reacquaint ourselves with the many innovations that she introduced during the year of the nurse. Now, I would like to welcome our two new speakers to the uh, podium. We originally had two or uh, three speakers in this session. We will only have two, but we will manage, I think, quite well. Our first speaker this morning in this part of the session is Dr. Akiko Araki, and she is an executive officer of the Japanese Nursing Association. Her work focuses on home-based nursing, long-term care insurance systems, and nursing at long-term care facilities. Her efforts also extend to restructuring of the credentialing system to meet changing societal needs in Japan. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Araki. I'm so sorry, there are some trouble on my uh, presentation file. But anyway, I'd like to talk about uh, activities of Japanese nursing associations, how to promote community-based nursing care. And uh, I have three points of uh, today's presentation. The first three, I, I will uh, touch uh, briefly current situation uh, in Japan. And after that, I would like to introduce our Japanese nurse, Nursing Association's activities and the future vision 
of uh, uh, our Japanese nursing, um, we published uh, 2015. And you know the Japanese uh, uh, Japan is facing the society of super aging with fewer children, you know, and uh, uh, many of the Asian countries are facing now. So the situation is no uh, precedent around the world, you know. And uh, the social security benefit is increasing. Uh, this affects greatly to national finance. It seems my presentation is came up. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So. <laughs> So and this this background the Japanese government promote the reform of social security system to maintain the health system so this made the shift from medical center to care uh, focus on the cure to communicate community based integrated care system focused on living at community with disease In 2015, JNA published Future Vision of Nursing. In anticipation of the coming 10 years of transformation, JNA expressed how nursing and nursing profession should be through this vision to nursing profession as well as society. As the slide shows, the vision presents nursing support and sustains human life, living, and dignity. JNA promotes various efforts for nursing profession to contribute to the society. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> the society that uh, people in any condition of health can live with by own, one's own life value. So this can be achieved as we, uh, nursing professions, have the bo both viewpoint of health and living. In the vision, JNA explained that nursing professions have the role uh, to link between people's living and health and medical and welfare uh, through the life course. As the slide shows, we marshal the life course into six stages. In the vision, JNA stated that nursing professions support all the people at all the settings throughout their life course. We believe that we must create the community-based integrated care system for all persons, including not only elders, but also people rearing children, children and the people with disabilities, can live with a sense of reassurance. With this, we work to enhance the partnership among nursing professions in their community. The needs of the community become complicated and varied very much. In this essential to link the resources of community and to provide seamless services, 
nursing professions working at all the settings are the key for coordination and management as they grasp the needs and resources of the community. I'd like to introduce a few examples of JNA activities. We work to strengthen the network among nursing professions. In 2015, we start, started the model activities aiming for establishing a mechanism to support the lives of population with a sense of reassurance through the development of intra-professional collaboration. In 2017, the activities were implemented at 20 sites all over, the, all over Japan. They reinforced the network foundation among nursing professions and related workers at their communities through the meeting with professions. The workshop with, with the population and so on. This achieved positive outcomes for example, promoting mutual understanding of nursing professions and the different areas of work, organizing community issues, and stimulating smooth discharge support. I'd like to uh, uh, talk about the next example. In Japan, the rescue rates of an extremely low birth weight babies and severely ill children, newborns are very high. Also, the study indicated that the number of children requiring, sorry, oh. The number of children requiring medical care at home in, on the rise at the slide shows. Our future vision holds the support for healthy birth and growth. JNA promotes to support transition of NICU and NSCU or GCU hospitalized children and their families to move into home-based care as a part of a community-based integrated care system for all generations. In 2015, JNA conducted an interview survey to nurses working at the hospitals and visiting nurses. The result indicated that there were gaps between nurses at the hospitals and the visiting nurses, nursing situation about the timing of informed discharge and the awareness toward medical care at home. Nurses working at the hospitals are required to provide care to the children right at the moment and right in front of them. To support transition to home-based care, they also have to have the image of children growing up at home and the community after discharge when they provide care at the hospital. However, there were not enough education programs and trainings for nurses to support children and their families make a smooth transition from NICU discharge to home-based care. In 2016, JNA developed the pathway and the education program to support children's transition to home-based care with the aim to standardize the care provision. In 2017, JNA start, started training of trainers. As we thought that nurses taking a leader's role on site are the key for utilization of the pathway and the program. We could say the training was very effective. About 300 nurses joined the training in the past two years. The graduate of the training started to take the leadership role concerning introduction of the pathway and the ed education program in, into their facilities. In addition, they 
worked on the communicate and collaborate more among nursing staff and with other professionals. We also have other works to strengthen the partnership among nursing profession in communities. JNA would, will keep our effort to create an enabling environment for nursing professions to play their role so that people living at the communities can receive seamless and, and assured care. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, sorry for bothering you, the presentation trouble. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Akiko. This was an excellent presentation. I'm really sorry that we weren't able to facilitate your slides better. Uh, and it, was, it is really exciting to hear how our nursing associations, the members of ICN, are drivers of innovation to improve care in the community. Now our second speaker, Simon Lungwani, is president of the Democratic Nursing Organization of South Africa, commonly called DINOSA, the largest nurses trade union in the country and probably one of the largest in Africa, if not the largest. <laughs> uh, prior to his current position, he served at all levels of DINOSA from being a branch shop steward a regional and provincial leader before being elected DINOSA president, which is a full-time position. So, Simon, welcome to the podium. Well, thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, that's my name, the, my organization, that's the outline. And in introduction, I think we need to just refer to this as innovative ideas that we need to ensure that we achieve sustainable development goals. So we need to do a lot of work in increasing awareness, putting more value on the importance and the value of um, innovation in nursing, so that we create more understanding in terms of uh, the contribution that nurses can, can add in innovation within health. And therefore, we must put more efforts in that regard. In our country, South Africa, in 2011, and our minister entered into an agreement with the president and all stakeholders in the country and signed what we called a negotiated service agreement with four pillars, which included increasing the life expectancy, decreasing child and maternal mortality, combating HIV and AIDS, and decreasing the burden of disease from tuberculosis, and strengthening health care system effectiveness within the country. The primary focus was to alleviate hospital burdens and strengthening preventative care, as well as promoting health, with a focus as well to have primary health care re-engineered to focus more on the rural areas uh, that we have within the country. I will just highlight in this paper a bit of uh, PHC best practices that have happened within the country. As we know that 80% uh, of the health care is provided by nurses worldwide. It is the same in our country, can even go to uh, up around 85%. Doctors are a small portion, and I think this is a common trend within Africa. Therefore, it says we are well positioned 
to provide the most needed, needed innovative solutions to many global health challenges that we have. Obviously, the practice environment is dependent on where you come from. We have countries that are economically better. We have developed and developing countries. I come from a developing country, and that means, in translation, there is a poor health financing systems, there is constraint of resources, and most likely we have, um, we, we have task shifting in a manner of trying to cover the health needs that are there. And obviously, a lot of inequalities where you have the haves and the have-nots in political terms, or those who are better off financially and can afford to buy health care in a private sector or anywhere they can fly all over and get health care. But we know that very well that in developed countries, the, the system is much different. There's good health financing and better health systems are in place. Well, nurses impact. I believe that we have a major role to play in making an impact in the following areas, in health promotion, in disease prevention, um, when it comes to the waiting times, management in the system, that includes your cues management, uh, access to medication, effective referral systems, and the integration of indigenous knowledge into healthcare provision itself. I do know that some countries like China, India, have done well on the last part of uh, um, indigenous knowledge integration. That slide depicts the disease burden, particularly from uh, diabetes in my country. But overall, it says diabetes has doubled in a short space of time. And we know that if that happens, we're going to have challenges of vision, which is eyesight. Therefore, issues of blindness are going to happen. We know there's going to be challenge of renal failures. We also may experience heart problems, the strokes, sometimes loss of limbs, and many others. And this last slide tells us that we really must do something, otherwise the health system will clock and we'll have more problems as a society. As you can see, in one of the hospitals, the queues just become so, so long, and then it says the strain on the nurses becomes more difficult. And that's an example of a clinic, people queuing outside to enter a clinic in a day. It's, it's, it's because of that burden of disease that is increasing. And if we don't do something, this situation will just worsen off. We must just do something and we should participate. We have just few examples of innovate, innovative practices that in our country we have, we have introduced, and these are all nurse-led. We have what we call the word-based outreach teams. Um, we, we abbreviate them at that. We are used to calling them WeBot. But this is where there is a team of health professionals and primarily led by doctors and nurses. There's a component which is primarily just led by nurses. And I do know that before we introduced this one, we had to study what the Spanish are doing, the Cubans and the Brazilians. We have then gone with the model of Brazil, um, more of a similar, but adjusting it to our own context. But essentially, we say it's a community-oriented primary health care. And in terms of the doctors, there's another program that we call Mandela Fidel Castro, but its aim is to scaling up of a training of medical doctors. Now, in the WIPOT, or the primary health care nurses-led project, Nurses become more of a leader, but those are the part of the other professionals that are there. There is a cohort of community health workers. These are primarily people who are not trained in health profession, but they are used there to complement and to add more of the human resource that we do not have, particularly um, because professionals are in a scarcity. Now, nurses then work with with this community health care closely as their supervisors and nurses train them. 
but also they mentor and coach them so, so that they can be the extra hand for nurses within the community. That, that picture shows, the, the, it depicts how the system works, so it's interrelated and entangled together. You can see the, that area shows where the, the community is and the burden of disease and all the other issues that are happening. So all the interactions happens there. But there's a way in which that system talks to each other until referral to a specialized or tertiary hospital to doctors, integration, integration with the community and other role players within the community leadership. In the use of technology, we have this, the community, the WeBoard community um, oriented program uses an e-health system where cell phones are used and to capture data and information that these community healthcare workers are finding within, within the communities. But basically, it is linked to a professional. So a professional nurse will be sitting in a system seeing that in this particular area, there is a person with this particular disease and this is how they can intervene, but also talk to the community healthcare worker so that they can advise them on what to do, even including referral to the clinic where the professional nurse will be based and, and assist that person. So there's a, there's, a, there's a joint communication, as I've shown that. There's another initiative we call the Nest Owned Clinic. Essentially, it's an entrepreneurial initi initiative where nurses are encouraged to start their own private clinics, and they have seed funding, which is made available from uh, other stakeholders within, and government is encouraging it. The aim is to ensure that at least we have nurses that are providing healthcare in an area that is needed, and they are going to provide it at a, a low cost than the mainstream private health care. And in that context, then government provides other medication or other in, uh, interventions that are needed, such as the EPI and the family planning. The intention is to make sure that people can access it for free in that space, but uh, it must be simpler for nurses to provide so they don't have to spend money to acquire, to acquire it. Now, in other initiatives of dealing with uh, NCDs, we have got um, a large number of mushrooming of um, exercise parks within the villages and uh, townships. But essentially, all our municipalities are, in, are, are encouraged to make sure that within communities that they are governing, they provide this as part of the service so that people are encouraged to keep on exercising so that the problem of NCDs can be reduced within. Um, we also have uh, exercise clubs. I'm going to show you a picture of what happens. Also traditional dancers. In South Africa, we have many traditional dances because of our own different ethnic and tribal differences. But in all the commonalities that there are those traditional dances that is played, and most of them it's physically good enough to be an, an, an exercise that can promote health. That is a picture of um, old women <coughs> playing soccer. <coughs> We have, in, in, in South Africa, it was not common for, for women to play soccer. But when this, thing, this program came, we said, even women who are old can do this exercise. Hence, we have that team. Now we even have a national team that plays, and they play very well, and they go all over the world. And we encourage it to happen when predominantly they will be uh, condemned to just cooking and staying in, the, in, in, in their houses and so on. But this is a new thing that happens. And that picture shows what municipalities are doing. They create the, the, the gyms within their own places. You can see the difference. That one, there's grass here, there's no grass. So even if it's in a most rural setup, you can do this. And even if you don't have enough resources to do that, you can start somewhere and develop it. But this is all created by government through the local municipalities. That is the same, and the disparity you can see as well. Now, the integration of indigenous knowledge in, in South Africa, we have many indigenous trees and foods. But often in the past, we wouldn't embrace the knowledge that was developed within the in indigenous systems. The, the research has shown that 82% of our population, when they get sick, the first contact of seeking healthcare they go to traditional medicine 
whether we have a traditional healer, whether you have um, um, a religious format of some sort, but 82% of our population, before they get to the clinic or any Western medicine, they start from the traditional uh, knowledge system. So we have encouraged that we should integrate that information so that it becomes part of what we do. We promotion of herbal gardens, uh, increased use of uh, herbal remedies. There is a tree called Moringa in our country. We call it a tree of life. And apparently, according to the, to, our, to the system, it is known to be a tree that can heal most diseases and it helps a lot. There's research that shows that it's very good in, in, in dealing with uh, detoxing anybody. Training of traditional health practices, practitioners, they are trained on the aseptic techniques and many others, uses of blades and disinfections. But before we do that, we must consider that it's not easy. And there are two things that we, we see. Media continuously tarnishing the image of nursing, and then it leads to the community having low confidence on nurses. But we still believe we must embrace innovation by nurses, and we must in, encourage integration of indigenous knowledge. And we are, we are pushing government to invest more into the in technology that we can use within the healthcare. And in conclusion, I think we need to create a supportive climate that, needs, that, that is going to, to assist in encouraging creativity and innovation, innovation activities within our own countries. And as organizations that are represented here, NNAs and any other person, we must continue to encourage and lobby that governments assist us in this regard. It is up to us as nurses to embrace the idea of change through innovation and to make a concerted effort to become involved ourselves. I believe the slogan we must use should say, nothing about us without us. Gracias. Merci beaucoup. Obrigado. Baya Dangi. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Simon, for this uh, wonderful presentation. And thank you to both of our presenters this morning. I heard that teams and technology are two key innovations for moving beyond healthcare to health and moving beyond hospitals to community. And the goal, of course, is to improve quality and move from quality to value. So thank you so much for telling these stories from our national nurses associations and how you are really working uh, in your countries to improve and to move uh, healthcare into the communities and to improve the primary health care as a vehicle to universal health coverage. So that concludes our uh, session this morning. Thank you all, and thank you especially to Simon and Akiko.